There are many games out there that deal with grief as a theme, but it's often portrayed as an obstacle to overcome, something to get over. The main character goes through an arc and comes out the other side with a sense of accomplishment, catharsis, closure. And while I don't want to call games out for being too unrealistic, this has simply not been my experience with grief. Which is why Life is Strange Before the Storm is such a special game to me, as its approach to grief is far more familiar. I too lost parents at a young age, both of them, so I feel a special kinship with Chloe, not just because of some of the factual similarities we share, but because of the way that grief has affected our lives. It's only after experiencing a tragedy that you realise certain things about life. For one, grief isn't a phase, you never get over it and return to normal. It stays with you for your entire life. All that happens is that you learn to accept the change that you've experienced, though this in turn changes you as a person, for better or worse. I can understand and even appreciate wanting to combat grief in a direct and cliched manner, but this game isn't so simple. Chloe isn't out to uncover a hidden truth about her father's death, or embark on a journey that'll bring her closer to him. All she has to do is just carry on living her life. He's dead, and he's never coming back. Chloe is all alone, not so much in a physical sense, but emotionally. During my mum's funeral, there was a sermon that was read out that has really stuck with me. Grief by Cardinal Hume. During an awful time in my life, it was comforting to have these words said out loud, to have some language put to the pain that I was feeling. But something that really stood out to me was the emphasis on loneliness. Grief is one of the loneliest things that a person can endure. You can be surrounded by friends and family who all offer the warmest and kindest of words, yet still feel adrift on an island, all alone. Another's words do not help. A recent argument explains little for having tried too much. Silence is the best response to another's grief. Not the silence that is a pause in speech, awkward and unwanted, but one that unites heart to heart. And what better place to find such a thing, to find such an understanding silence, than in someone who understands you the most, like, say, a best friend? But what if, when you needed your best friend the most, they left you? What if, during the loneliest time of your life, you were left to feel even more alone? What if, after repeated attempts to get back in touch with your friend, they were quiet and unresponsive? What impact do you think that would have on a young Chloe? Reading through her diary and messages hit quite close to home for me, because I also felt a similar sense of abandonment at my lowest point. I don't really want to get into the nitty gritty details here, but the point is that during such an awful time, I didn't feel as if my friends really cared, to be frank, that they didn't want my grief to be their problem. There was no harm intended by anyone, but it made me feel really dejected deathly alone, and as a result I started to become reclusive, withdrawn, and to be totally honest, I'm still like that to this day. I've developed major trust issues with people in general, which is why I can recognise a similar mistrust of people in Chloe. She is now so used to feeling alone that she has no real choice but to just embrace it. It's not that Chloe is unfriendly. In fact, she seemed well liked at her school and even has some good times with her classmates, but none of them are close friends. She keeps them at arm's length. At times it feels as if she revels in her loner status, but even Chloe knows that, on some level, she would like nothing more than to have a deep, meaningful bond again. A true heart-to-heart -heart connection. But letting somebody in after convincing yourself that you're better off alone is a scary and vulnerable thing to do. Which is where Rachel comes in, a charismatic, insightful, beautiful young woman who sweeps Chloe off her feet. Such an experience can be both exhilarating and nerve-wracking. There's a moment I really like in the drama club scene, where Rachel asks for her belt and you have to decide how to give it to her. Throwing the belt might hurt her in the head or something, but it would be rude just to walk around when she's changing, right? But if you do decide to walk around, there's yet another choice. Let her know that you're there or say nothing. 
I'm sure that many have already derived decisions like these as yet more meaningless choices that don't really affect the story. But I think that would be a really unfair assessment. Moments like this help put you into Chloe's mindset and make you consider the potential for social awkwardness. I'm sure we can all relate to that. We want to make a good impression on someone, either a potential friend or otherwise. But you don't want to come off as too eager or say the wrong thing, so you question every decision you make. This moment in particular stands out to me. I I spend most of my time around people worrying that I'm <laughs> being too clingy or not giving enough space or something like that. But with Chloe, it's not just about trying to impress the popular kid in school. She feels a connection with Rachel, a connection that she hasn't felt since her dad died and her best friend left. Whether she knows it or not, she sees this as her chance to refill that void. That's a lot of pressure to put on a relationship that has barely even begun. Consider what happens when Rachel starts to become withdrawn in the junkyard. Chloe assumes that it's all her fault somehow, like she failed in some way, and she is desperate to fix the situation. Yeah, I, I get it. I know I'm not the easiest person to be around. I don't exactly have tons of experience with the whole friendship thing. Not everything revolves around you, Chloe. Then, when Rachel leaves after their argument, Fuck up, Rachel. Chloe stumbles across her dad's old car, the one he died in, acting as some sort of sick reminder. She's all alone, again. Well, not really, as they soon make up, but even still, Chloe is always going to have this pain inside her. However, it's also clear that she's starting to find some peace, thanks to Rachel. I'm sure there's still a lot of drama for these crazy teens to get mixed up in, but if Deck Nine and Don't Nod simply wanted to do a 10 episode series of these characters just hanging out, occasionally getting into trouble, then I would totally be okay with that. One of the things that I respect most about this game is that it doesn't really have a plot. The blossoming friendship aside, the game is mostly just about Chloe living from day to day, and given how involving the series still is, I think that's a testament to how well drawn out she is. I don't think I've ever related to a character as much as I have with Chloe Price. Though I must admit, I did feel a touch of awkwardness when, after playing a game about young women, the credits rolled and, okay, guy, guy, guy another guy, lead writer's a guy, oh gosh. I mean, yeah, okay, there is a woman on the writing staff, two in fact, and I know it's not impossible for a man to write a female's perspective, but the point is that, as much as I love this game, if someone came up to me and said that it wasn't actually an accurate portrayal of being a young woman, then I would just have to defer to their judgement because I have no real experience in that matter. But when it comes to the portrayal of a young person stricken with grief, anger, confusion and loneliness, then I can speak to that. And this game gets it pretty fucking perfect. I thought Chloe Price doesn't need friends. I... I thought so too... before today. I... I guess it's easier to be alone if you decide it's a choice. I'm sorry... for whatever I did or... didn't do. Today was the best day I've had since... since my dad died. And I screwed it up somehow. Like I screw everything up, cause... I'm a fucking screw-up. Chloe, please. I don't want to be alone anymore. <laughs> 